Welcome to the Grace of Eugene podcast. We exist to help every person in our sphere of influence to encounter Christ, experience biblical community, and extend God's kingdom. You can learn more about us at gracecityeugene.com. Here's the podcast. We are continuing in our Philippians sermon series. Today, this is week nine. There will be 13 in total, so we got a few left. Um, but I, I think that for me at least, like as I'm going through preparing for each of these sermons and the discussions that happen in our life groups and throughout the week, it's been very life-giving and invigorating to dig into to Paul's letter to the church and I pray that it continues to be encouraging for us. I know that life groups may be taking like a break for the summer, but that doesn't mean that the conversations can't continue to happen. So I'd encourage you, still get together, people. Talk about this stuff. And I'm talking about how awesome this series is. Well, I see the screen says danger behind me. So um, <laughs> thanks, Lauren. <laughs> um, so anyway, I'll get into the title of the sermon in a second. I want to encourage y'all. Pastor David brought up a good, great point last week. Um, in his church, uh, they, they have certain values that they just communicate on the regular. And since their inception as a church plant, which they had to start in the middle of COVID, so things were a little different for them to get, get traction. But they always say participation is better than observation. And I think you had uh, some examples. He led us in some examples of what that looks like. But I want to encourage you, if you're here in the room this morning, this is corporate worship. This is a family coming together and worshiping. This is not just a lecture classroom where you come in, you get your notes, you try not to be seen, and then you scoot out. I want to encourage you that if something, like, is impactful to you, like, give an amen, give a right on, like something, make some noise. So one, so I know you're awake, but two, there may be people in here that have never heard a sermon before. And when you exclaim or say something about that point, it's like, oh, to someone who's maybe new to this, ah, oh, I, should, I should probably like retain that. Maybe that's meaningful, right? It's helping disciple people and how to receive God's word corporately as a family. So I just want to encourage you in that. Each one of you can participate in how we as a corporate, as a collective family, receive the word and engage in worship. And so I want to encourage you that participation is way better than observation. Amen? Awesome. Uh, so the title of this message is Danger, and as I read this, I think you will see why. We're in Philippians chapter 3. We're going to be in the first 11 verses. And so Danger, maybe as we're reading, see why, why might Pastor Chris call this message Danger. Chapter 3, starting in verse 1, Paul says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, when he was eight, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ." And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for what you have to speak to us through it today. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would inform my words, that you would break down any barriers to receiving your truth and to us applying this in our lives today. Father, I pray that through this message, through this time together, you would be made known, you would be glorified, and that each person in here would know what their next step is in pursuing and following Jesus. So we thank you. Amen. All right. So, danger. Danger, danger, danger. 
I think when I read this first verse, it helps highlight that for me. And so I want to retouch on it real quick. It says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, meaning to write this over and over, is no trouble to me. And it's safe for you. Other translations say it's a safeguard for your faith. So he's saying, Paul is making this connection between rejoicing and it being a function of your safety. Have you ever thought of it that way? Like me choosing to rejoice protects me from something. What I rejoice in protects me from something. You are in danger if you are not rejoicing in the Lord. So think about that for a second. What happens in your soul, in your spirit, when you have something and it's good, but you're not grateful for it? What happens when you have a home, you have been, a home has been provided for, but a new house went up a block away and you start to be discontent and you start to dream, daydream about what might it look like to live in a different neighborhood? I've always wanted that home in the country. That house is bigger. Why can't I have a bigger house? Man, they have a boat. I've always wanted a boat, right? Like there's something about not rejoicing in what we have that is an indicator of a lack of contentment and it has us looking elsewhere. We start to entertain what might be better, what grass might be greener. Maybe your friendships are hard, and you're like, man, this would be way easier if I could just find some different friends. Maybe your job's hard, and so you start looking at other jobs, and you're like, man, I would really like to do something else that isn't so hard, and it decreases your productivity in how you're working to, to exemplify the Lord in your current job. When we are not rejoicing in what we have, it causes us to entertain what other better options might be out there. And Paul is telling the church in Philippi, rejoice in the, law, in the Lord because it's a safeguard for your faith so that you start, don't start going looking for other cults and sects and other things that would take you away from him. And I said S-E-C-T-S just to clarify there. Sect. Okay. I saw some eyebrows raised. <clears throat> Danger. (laughs) Oh, it's going to be a good day. Think of how many stories you've heard of a marriage on the rocks that causes you to start to entertain. What if this, what if there was something better? What if this isn't the best that I could get? What if there is something else? Paul is well aware of the danger of lacking gratefulness and rejoicing for the things that the Lord has given you in your life. And he's telling the people here, rejoice because it will safeguard your faith. It, is, it provides you safety. This, this could be an entire sermon, but we have some other verses to go through. But I want to encourage you, family, that a failure to rejoice makes you susceptible to discontent and therefore straying from your faith and remaining faithful in what God has set before you. The disposition of one who fails to rejoice has you looking for greener pastures. It has you looking for what might be better instead of recognizing the greatness that is before you. We still live in a broken world where things are hard and we don't have everything we think we deserve or everything that we want. And the enemy would like nothing better than for that to cause us to question if God is even good in the first place. And Paul is reminding them, God is good. Our faith is in him. He has given you salvation. Be content with that. Rejoice in it so that your faith is safeguarded, so that your heart is protected from all the other options and false idols that the world and the enemy are trying to throw at you. Family, rejoice. How many times in this sermon series has Paul talked about joy and rejoicing? A lot. It continues to come up and he says, hey, the fact that I'm saying this again, that's no trouble to me because y'all need to hear it. He starts it off with that because it's for your safety. It's because he loves you. He cares. Be like safeguard your faith with rejoicing, not trying to understand every little thing in your head. He doesn't say, hey, Study this until you know everything, until you can answer everything about God to everybody that doesn't know him. Then your faith will be strengthened. No. He says rejoice. Have a disposition of rejoicing 
of joy in your life, of being grateful for what the Lord has done, who he says he is to you, and that will safeguard you from straying and all of the things that will try to take you away from following him. Amen? Rejoice, family. There is a connection between rejoicing and our safety, the safeguarding of our faith. And if we miss that, we miss one of the single most important parts of Paul's letter to this church. So we must rejoice. Like, seriously, we need to rejoice. He's saying, this isn't just like a side dish. Like, rejoice. Seriously, take my word for it. You need to rejoice. And then he continues in the very next verse, and he says, look out. Now, there's not exclamation points because Paul was clearly not a grammar major, and there's just a lot of commas. He writes a little bit like me where almost everything I just read to you was one sentence. <laughs> <clears throat> And my wife's not in here, so you can ask her after service. She's up teaching Kid City. But there's often times where I'll write something, even like as simple as an email. Like, will you proofread this for me? Because I'm a speaker, not a writer. And she'll just say, she'll read it, and she's like, okay, I need about 30 minutes. I'm like, why? To put some periods in there? She goes, you gave me one really long sentence. I got some work to do. Thank you, babe. Um, and so uh, he goes right on to the next thing. And I imagine if Paul had somebody to proofread his letter for him, there would probably be exclamation points here, not commas. Look out for the dogs, right? Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Jesus Christ and put no confidence in the flesh. So if you're unfamiliar with the terms like mutilating of the flesh and circumcision and, the, and what that means in the Bible, what was happening is there were people that said in order to be in right standing with God, men had to be circumcised. And he's referring to that as the mutilation of the flesh. It's a Jesus and kind of thing. And if you've been around here enough, you've heard us talk about in Colossians and stuff like Jesus and is not following Jesus. That's trying to put other religious things on top of it, trying to add your own rules to safeguard yourself instead of just trusting and following Jesus with everything. He's saying your confidence in your status before God is not in whether or not you're circumcised. It's in the work of the Lord Jesus. So he's not trying to get into some medical journal about circumcision. He's saying, don't put your confidence in whether you've been circumcised or not. You don't, we don't put our confidence in the flesh or what we can earn in our own right. We put our confidence in the work of the cross and what Jesus did. That alone is where we put our confidence. So you could read commentaries for days about the significance of all the words and all this. And I'm like, I'm reading through it and I'm like, this is just saying something really simple. Don't put your confidence in what you can do, what you can control, what you can yield from your efforts. Put your confidence in what the Lord Jesus has done for you, and then live a life that reflects that that's where your confidence is. Can I get an amen from somebody in the room this morning? You do not have to earn your right standing before Jesus. Praise God for that. If that was the case, man, there wouldn't be anybody here that could preach. Because no one would have the right to get up here and declare the word of God from a place of perfection and having achieved and attained anything. Because we have all fallen short of the glory of God. But we stand not on our own righteousness, but on the righteousness of Christ Jesus and the work done on the cross. That is great news. If that doesn't take a little pressure off of you, then go back this coming week and listen to that part again in the message. Or just read Philippians, I guess it's right there too. Nothing of the flesh will qualify you. Jesus did that on the cross. And then Paul goes into this next, verses 4 through 11, and he basically tells us this. He says, trust me, I know. He's saying, rejoice, it'll safeguard your faith. Don't rely on anything you can do. Don't rely on any works of the flesh or trying to earn anything. Rely fully on what Jesus has done. He's already paid the price. Trust me, I know. Now, you read through this, and I was talking with Casey last night as we were watching an invigorating baseball game. Um, here's to game three and the Ducks dominating, but that shouldn't be in the sermon. Come on, Ducks. Um, <clears throat> and I said, man, Paul in this almost seems like, anybody ever been down to Aslan for like the Shakespeare Festival? Like we went to that when I was in high school. And it, it, Paul like all of a sudden seems so Shakespearean in what he's saying here. He's like, let me, let me just read it for you and view it through that lens, okay? Though I myself have reason for, obviously I'm changing how I'm reading it, so that's not totally fair. <laughs> 
I have an accent. Though I myself may have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of his life, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew, a he of Hebrews, as to the law. Of fair, like he's going on and giving you all this information. But what is he saying? If anybody earned status before Jesus, it was him. And then Jesus entered his life and said, no, 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 you got it wrong. And then he became an apostle who wrote over half of the New Testament and has formed, planted, and pastored many of the first churches. And he's saying, all that stuff I did, that I was blameless before the Mosaic law, that I followed all the rules just right, like none of that, he says, all of that was a loss. And my middle school daughter would say, it was an L. All of it was a loss. Did I get that right, students? I'm trying, to, I'm trying to keep, you know, in the, in the know. Um, all of that was a loss. None of that mattered. None of that does anything for me in the paradigm of faithfully following Jesus. He lived this life pursuant of the Mosaic law, all of the Jewish customs and the religious practices. And he says, as to that, I lived it perfectly. But it gains me nothing. It was all a loss because what I actually need is to be found in Christ Jesus, to have my faith in him, to know him, to be with him, to follow Christ Jesus. I think it might have even been underlined as you're going through the verses, like every time it says in Christ Jesus, found in him, to be known by and to know him. That is the win, that he would know Jesus and follow him. So rejoice Because it's a safeguard of your faith, you trust fully in Jesus, not any works you can do or anything of the flesh. And trust me, I know, because if anybody thinks that they could earn this, I earned it more. But I missed the point, and all of that was a loss, because what I actually need, what my heart actually needs, and what the world around me actually needs through me is Christ Jesus. And Christ crucified preached to them. The good news and the hope of eternal life because of the work on the cross, not the work of my life. Now, let's not get it twisted. Our life should look like a representation of Jesus if we say we're going to follow him. You don't just get to sit back and be like, oh, it's all Jesus. I'm just going to do what I want because Jesus, right? Like when you put your faith in Jesus, it's not some sort of just hell insurance policy that just in case things go bad, you're safe from it. And now you can keep living your life the same way. That's not what following Jesus means. It means I didn't earn this. I received the gift. And as someone whose life has been radically impacted, transformed as a matter of fact because of the work of the cross, I will live in a way that continuously points to that. I will live in a way that reflects or represents Jesus everywhere that I go. It's not about passively sitting back and being like, see that tree? Obviously a creator created it. Yes, that's true. But how are you living your life to actively preach good news and bring hope into situations that are dark? Every one of us in here knows somebody who is clinically depressed. Fair statement? Everybody in here knows somebody who is isolated. Maybe they weren't before COVID, they are now. I went to the coffee shop the other day, and I still heard somebody came in, they saw someone they hadn't seen in years, they'd be like, this is our first time out since COVID. And I'm like, whoa, this is your first time even in a coffee shop since COVID. Like, we've been ordering groceries in, I'm eavesdropping, I probably need to repent for that, but I'm hearing this conversation, I'm like, you don't know you're going to be in a sermon series, or a sermon illustration. Um... people are still extremely isolated. Like, think about that. I'd be willing to bet, I'm not a statistician, but I'd be willing to bet they're not the only ones. I don't think I found the unicorn of Eugene. That, like, oh, that's the one person that hasn't been out. Like, people are isolated, and you know them. You can see the faces. The names are popping into your mind right now. And you living, not of the flesh, but uh, out of what Jesus has done for you, means that you have to have compassion and care for those people. And when you have the answer for the condition they have, you are obligated by what Jesus has done for you to share that with them. Now, what that looks like, like you, we'll help you if you want help, but let's start out by like caring about and talking to people. And when they ask you, well, what, can you come over for this on Sunday? They're like, oh, what time? Oh, we're thinking of doing it around 11. Hey, I'd love to hang out with you, but I'm going to have to come after church. Not like, yeah, and then you skip church. Like, did you know that's a really easy way to testify to the fact that you, like, love Jesus is to just be honest about the things you do with Jesus' people? 
I remember when I first got plugged in with the church, and I was in a small group on a weeknight, and none of my friends cared anything about Jesus or small group, you know, go figure. And they'd always be like, hey, let's go do this, go do this. I'm like, oh, I can't. Like, what do you got going on? It's like, oh, I'm just really tired. I need rest. It's like, and every time, like, something in me with twins, like, oh, man, why am I being convicted about lying all all of a sudden? And I don't believe it was the conviction about lying. I believe it's because God's saying, I'm teeing you up an opportunity to tell them what you're doing, to tell them what you believe in, to tell them what you have oriented your life around, but you're too scared to just be honest. You'll hear me say this all the time. If you don't know how to testify to Jesus and tell people what you believe, just start with being honest when it comes up. Like, it's naturally going to come up. Someone's going to invite you to something. You have a small group. Sorry, I have my church's small group that night. Can we find another time? And they're probably not going to say, I'm never talking to you again. They're going to say, oh, cool. And it gets filed away. And then a few months later, things are hard. And like, man, you've been really steady and faithful as a friend to me. And you mentioned this thing about small group. Can I, can I talk to you about your church? What, what does that look like for you? And then things come up. You didn't have to go hold up a sign with some verse from Revelation and yell at them. You just had to care about them and be honest. I don't think there's a single person in here that's here because anybody held up a sign. In fact, I, I know. You're here because somebody cared enough to share with you about their life, to let you in, to be honest to ask you how your day was going before there was any real connection in any spheres of their daily life. Because if you live a life that has been impacted by Jesus, you therefore live a life that has to bring impact to others. And I'm not even saying like, you need to conjure up the ability to impact others. No, if if your life has been impacted, like you don't really even have to do anything and it will overflow. If you stay in communion with Jesus, if you read his word, if you talk to him, if you pray, if you are in community, the living God will flow out of you. You don't have to go take a class on how do I overflow Jesus. Now, we can help you with that. It's called discipleship. It's a pretty good thing. But if you read your word, if you pray, and then you apply what Jesus is calling you to apply, the necessary outcome of that will be impacting the world for good. Because you cannot live the countercultural lifestyle of a follower of Jesus without it affecting change around you. There is nothing camouflaged about the way of following Jesus. You can't walk into an environment and be a chameleon and be faithful to following Jesus. If you're faithful to following Jesus, I hate to tell you this, but you're going to stick out like wearing a green jersey in Corvallis. Okay, That's a duck beaver thing for those of you that didn't get it. You're going to stick out. You're going to be out of the culture. It's not going to work. People are going to think something's weird. You can't just blend in when you live a life that the Bible says is set apart. You cannot live set apart in a culture in a way that is countercultural and not stick out. And eventually, either people ask questions or you tell them why you're acting that way, whatever it is. But you can't help but make an impact when God gets your heart and you live in a way that is to be in Christ Jesus, to follow him that you may gain Christ, as Paul says, knowing Christ Jesus as Lord, having faith in him, all the different ways he puts it. Verses 4 through 11 is just one big thought of, trust me, I know. Trust me, I know. Parents understand this all too well. Your kid's like, well, why shouldn't I do that? It's like, just trust me, I know. I learned it the hard way. Can you please not do the same? <clears throat> Can you build upon what I've learned and experienced as your dad? Instead of you having to go figure it out from scratch, because that wasn't fun. Rejoice. It'll safeguard your faith. It'll safeguard your faith. Look out, because it's not about all the other religions or sect groups that try to tell you, like, hey, this is all about what you do and reaching the numbers and all these religious outlines. No, it's not about what you can do. It's not about the flesh. It's about what Jesus did in living a life that reflects that. It's that simple. It's that simple. And Paul does not confuse any words here that he is well aware of the dangers that are presented to us or that we will encounter as we follow Jesus. He doesn't say, hey, everything's going to be super easy. This is like you're hardly going to realize that you're any different than anyone else. 
he's really clear in the danger of, in his words, conducting ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's been resonating throughout this book, right? Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But when we are doing it for the proper reasons, when we are doing it for biblical reasons and motives to reflect and represent Jesus in our cities, in our families, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, then we rejoice even though it may look a little dangerous. One of the hardest places I've ever been called or caused to rejoice is in my final year at U of O. I went back as a non-traditional student. Many of you know this story or that I did that. When we moved here to plant the church, I also enrolled to get a sociology degree at the U of O as a minister because I wanted to start the campus ministry. This is way back in the day, 2013, 14, 15. And, um, and I was in these sociology classes where it was like actively mocking what I believed. Doc was in those classes with me, so if you don't believe me, you can talk to him. But oftentimes they would go around the room, and I was one of the only non-traditional students, so everyone else, it's like, what are you studying? What's your name? What are you studying? What's your name? And to me, what on earth are you doing in here, and what's your name? Right? It, was, it was a different question because I kind of stuck out. And uh, they would often, I would, you know, there's like mocking that's just like, you're an idiot, and then there's mocking like, we're going to make you do a report on this very specific aspect of the class because it's totally against everything that I suspect you believe, that kind of thing, and I was always put in those positions, and I'd meet with professors, and they'd be like, what's it, how can you be studying like in this particular class, like Marxism, and say that you're a minister, like how does, how does this work? And it was hard. And I could have said, like, oh, I'm just a student trying to figure out what I'm doing, and nobody would have done, done anything any different. They wouldn't have known any different. But I said, ah, I'm actually in ministry. Like, I work full-time with the church. And um, in the midst of that and being mocked and people having their presuppositions about me and saying not-so-nice things and putting me in really awkward conversations in front of a lot of people, I got to choose to rejoice, to safeguard my faith from the other ideologies and things that were presented from me. I could have easily felt like guilty for my, or bad for myself, like, oh, this is so hard. Why me? Why is everybody so mean, right? Like, but I was also like 32, and so that wouldn't have been too becoming of me. But <clears throat> it would have been really easy to just shrink back, play the victim card. But I stood, stood on what I believed in, and I rejoiced because God is good, and there were people in the midst of that that got to hear about Jesus, there's somebody that's in, sitting in the church today because I was in that class and I got to love them and care about them and share Jesus with them. Now, it doesn't mean everything's easy for anybody, but it means that Jesus was made known. And I rejoiced in the midst of that hardship. And I know a lot of you, when I share just a little bit of that story, you're like, yep, going through that. Yep, I get it, pastor. Yep, been there. But what does it look like to still rejoice? To still rejoice. And I would argue what that means is you have a grasp on what Jesus has done for you. You have a grasp on the race that you are running. That it's not just about utilizing your faith to obtain something. It's about living out your faith to see transformation. You see, for too many decades, there's people that have associated themselves with Christianity because it gave some societal advantage. And if you didn't know, it's not the case anymore. Um, there's not a lot of societal advantage by saying, yeah, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. I'm following Jesus. That was, that was some decades ago. So now, like, that's not the reason you do it. You do it because, especially in our part of the country, like, you love Jesus. Your life has been changed. And whether you know how to, like, share it or not yet, you know that other people need that good news too. So worship team, you can come back up as we wrap up. This world tries to put masks and makeup on a lot of things. It tries to make a lot of things appealing, that those would receive your affection, that those would receive your worship. It tries to give you plenty of alternatives to Jesus that you could put your hope in. There's, there's plenty of them out there. But the reality about when you put masks and makeup on these things, they try to make it look all appealing. But the reality is, if you were to choose it, if you were to, to go for that and say, oh, I'm going to give this a shot, there is nothing good about it besides some presentation because it's trying to trick you. What I'm saying is, Paul was aware of this then, 
And we need to be aware of this now. There are plenty of people, ideologies, sects, and cults out there that will try to trick you, try to tell you, oh, it's the same thing. It's just we add a few things to it. Nothing needs to be added to your faith except maybe some courage and boldness every now and then. If you know what Jesus did for you and you can stand firm on that and walk forward in that, living a life that shows that transformative power that has happened in you, maybe a little courage added on to that. Imagine what will happen around you. Imagine what will happen around you. I frequently, like, I'll, I'll pray and just, like, dream about what it would look like if I continue to walk forward in boldness in my biological family, like with my relatives. Because in the city I live in, like, I'm relatively bold, and I have a lot of conversations about real things and about the things of Jesus with, with people I've never met. Like, Casey can tell you, we'll be just going around town doing, like, shopping for some event or something, and the next thing you know, a cashier, I'm talking to him for no reason or whatever, and, uh, or it seems like for no reason. But when I get around my family, it's like, man, they knew 19-year-old Chris. <laughs> now, that was a few years ago, and so... The devil tries to tell me, you have nothing to stand on. They know what you used to be. They're not going to want to hear what you have to say anyway. And it, it, like, tries to put a muzzle on me. Does anybody feel that way, that there's just certain spheres in their life that's like, I can't speak up here because they know too much about who I was. And what God showed me this week as I prepared for this message is even in your family and even those hard to till kind of grounds where seeds need to be planted, God's saying to me, and I'm praying this for you too, it's not about who you were, it's about who Jesus has transformed you into. And you're not going trying to say, hey, follow the God of my 19 year old Chris. I'm saying, look at me now, look what's changed. You, you can have that too. And what better example for the, the fact that they've been in proximity to me to see all that change to say, hey, this, this is what happened. This is what you observed. This is who did this in me, and he can also do it in you. Amen? So what if we would shift our perspective to I'm from I'm disqualified to the very thing that makes me qualified is very evident to those around me. And then we take a step of courage. We be bold about it. We rejoice that we have Christ Jesus in us, that we know him. We look out for the things that would try to draw us away. We look out for the things of pride and self-righteousness that would, we would try to earn our way into good graces with God. And we realize that Jesus already paid the price. And when we try to add to it, we're telling him it wasn't enough. It is enough. Everything that he did for us is completely enough. And we get to live our lives as a reflection of that. And it should change the world around you. Amen. Would you receive that good news for you and would it impact the way in which you see and interact with the world and the relationships around you? Let's pray. God, thank you for this time. Father, I thank you that you're good. And I thank you that even when the circumstances don't look good, we can rejoice. I thank you that when things are hard, we should rejoice not to try to trick ourselves into a better mood, but because of the fact that you are good, the price was paid on the cross, the tomb is empty, and we are in right standing with the God who created us if we have put our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We thank you for that. Would that be enough for us? And would that flow through us into the world around us? God, I pray that you would use each of us to bring redemption and wholeness into places that desperately need it. And we thank you for what it looks like for a community following you to reflect you and make positive change in the world and the spaces around it. God, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Let's stand and worship.